So welcome, uh, Duncan, to episode uh, th- uh, four now uh, of the podcast. I was going to say three, but <laughs> we're at the fourth one now. Welcome. Uh, it's going to be, I'm looking forward to this discussion. Uh, we're going to be discussing about CWC services uh, along with uh, um, uh, energy services. And we're going to be discussing a couple of the different outline that we have uh, for us today. But before we do that, uh, we'll start off with uh, an introduction, a little about you, uh, how you got involved in the business and uh, and so forth. And then we'll transition into a couple of the points that uh, we've highlighted uh, offline here. So uh, without further ado, Duncan, thanks for joining us today. Over to you. Uh, yeah, thanks, Sohei, for having me on. I'm very honored to be your fourth guest here to do one of these podcasts. I think what uh, you're doing to educate uh, people on the oil field services and energy space is, is fantastic. I think that... Uh, more of these sorts of things need to happen. So a little bit about myself and my background. Uh, I've had a bit of an eclectic background. Uh, I was involved in um, in my early days and in, in after university in the professional services world, in the corporate world, got my CA designation, CFA designation. More recently, I got my ICTD designation, so a corporate director type designation. Um, but in 2004, I became an energy services entrepreneur. I ended up uh, going out and raising some financing to buy my own um, back truck tank truck business, 20 back truck tank truck business called Rich Mountain Energy Services. Uh, ended up selling that for a significant amount of money um, uh, in a very short period of time. That was back in the income trust days where a lot of consolidation of energy service companies were happening. And so I made my my first wealth, I guess, off of Richmond. Uh, the guys we ended up selling to, we did um, a further roll-up strategy there. It was a company called Avenir Diversified Income Trust, and they had four pillars, one of which was oil field services. I ended up helping them uh, build out their energy service portfolio and, um, and, and creating size from that. And so we had then ended up... Um, uh, we then ended up uh, spinning out the assets of the oil field services from Avenir into a company called Essential Energy Services. So we were the um, the founders of Essential. I was the CFO and VP Business Development of that entity. Grew that business from zero to four hundred and ten million dollars uh, uh, in enterprise value, and we exited that opportunity in two thousand and eight. So as it worked, turned out. Uh, uh, on my first um, energy service company uh, that we sold in December 15th of 2005, this was the day that natural gas hit its all-time high of $15 in MCF. So couldn't have timed it any better there. Uh, with respect to, to getting out of the essential, we ended up buying another company called Builders Energy Services, and we let Builders Management Team run the company uh, upon that merger. And uh, as it turned out, that was also, that was in April of 2000 and uh, 2008. And as it turned out, that was six weeks before the top of the market from oil price perspective, $147 uh, a barrel. And uh, again, a very good win and timing on our part. So I thought, you know, three times lucky, that's kind of how it always works, isn't it? Uh, So I ended up joining the board of CWC in 2010. July of 2010, and um, and uh, by October, so that summer we went through with the former management team why this company wasn't making any money. Um, by October, the board had asked if I would be willing to take on the interim president and CEO role, but by then, those three short months of the summer months, I knew exactly what we needed to do, and, um, and so... Uh, I agreed to take take on the role of president and CEO uh, uh, from just the board position. And uh, I, I went to work to basically uh, put this company back on the right track with respect to profitability and, and making money. And so uh, put in place a new management team. And by January of 2011, the board removed the interim title. And here, you, here we are 13 plus years later and I'm still in the same chair as president and CEO. Uh, what I'm really proud about uh, during that time was when we, uh, when I took over and made the changes that were necessary in CWC, 
um, we got to a high of over 590% um, total return on investment for our shareholders. If you bought the stock on October the 1st, 2010, the day I started as president and CEO of this company, um, you would have had a high of 500, uh, 590% return on investment. Really proud of, of that track record. Of course, since that time, we have fallen back as, as uh, everyone has in the oil field services sector. Um, but I'm really, the one thing I'm really proud of is if you had invested the day that I started uh, in this company, um, which was trading at 20 cents, and all of the dividends that we gave in the 2012 to 2015 time frame. Uh, which worked out to over 21 cents uh, share per share of dividends, you would still be up to date probably around 110%. And so I'm really proud through all this downturn that we have experienced in our industry uh, that that I that if you had invested the day that I started, you would not have lost a penny uh, yet under my reign. And I'm Lots of things have happened to CWC during that period of time. and But that's one thing that I'm really proud about uh, in terms of um, our track record at CWC. And, and Duncan, could you share with us maybe uh, some of the, because it, it sounds like it's been a turnaround story, right? There's a couple of things that have uh, been uh, uh, a little bit all over, all over the place. Uh, in your case, you've been uh, about, you've had a chance to go out about three times before you ended up with this company. Could you maybe talk about some of the, the changes that were implemented uh, to create uh, the rewarding path for shareholders that it's been um, based on the numbers that you've just kind of mentioned in terms of shareholder returns? Yeah, sure. I mean, this company, as I said, was an, is a 19-year-old uh, company got founded in 2005. And, and back in those days, we had something called income trust, lots of capital floating around uh, during those periods of time. Uh, business models were to put together tons of assets together um, and, and make a sizable oil field services company because the capital was available. The problem with that model was that the income trust model required you to distribute all of the cash flow of the company that you made in a year back to shareholders. Great model for, for investors because they would get a distribution, which is exactly what the market was looking for at that time. Problem is this industry uh, requires a lot of capital investment, meaning you've got to put money back into the equipment. And all, if all you're doing in creating those um, business models is to give money back to investors or that um, uh, income trust unit holders, which, which is what we called them back in the, that time period, then you're not leaving any money on the, uh, enough on the table uh, to reinvest in the equipment and the change of technologies and everything else that needs to be done in the oil field service sector. It's a very capital intensive sector. And so it wasn't necessarily the best business model, but it is what investors wanted. And, and so, it, you know, I guess people got lazy and, and built built uh, companies based upon what was the easiest way to get access to capital. Of course, um, I, I, I benefited from all of those sorts of things uh, as my own private company got taken out by an income trust. But uh, fast forward to the day that um, Minister Flaherty of the federal government decided that we're gonna tax income trust, everybody else had to convert back to a corporate model. Fine, that's fine. You know, we can still pay dividends, not as tax efficient in terms of its distribution, all those sorts of things. But it, it was something that um, corporate or income trust ended up having to do to, to convert back to a corporation. Now, CWC was never an, an, an income trust. It was always a, a corporation. And so we never at this company had to go do that sort of thing. Having said that, um, you know, when I took over, we were coming out of a financial crisis in the 2008 timeframe, and um, and this company had put together a bunch of assets that uh, that were non-core to the business. It had always had a vision of being uh, CWC. While it wasn't my vision, it was the former president CEO's vision when he founded this company. 
uh, that it would get to 160 uh, service rings in a period of time. And so, uh, so that story stayed, you know, intact. They were on that path until the financial crisis happened. It got to about 40, I want to say about 42 service rigs back in 2008 before the financial crisis happened. And of course, they borrowed money to go build those rigs. And so one of the stories of this company, of its history, is that uh, in 2009 timeframe, after the financial crisis that happened in 2008, this company had $62 million of debt on $2 million at EBITDA, so 30 times the leverage. Clearly not a sustainable model. Um, at that time, um, uh, my largest shareholder today uh, went and basically converted, was the one who basically lent that money to the company to build those service rigs, of which it was supposed to have been paid back after those rigs were were built. Obviously, in you know, 2009, when that financial crisis was in the depths of that financial crisis, they couldn't do that. And so what they did, what Brookfield did, the my largest shareholder, was they converted uh, half of that debt uh, to equity at um, probably depressed prices, what would be considered depressed prices. And that's how they ended up with such a large position in CWC. Since that time, when I took over in 2010, we're back on the upswing, financial crisis is coming out of it already, and, and the company was on much better stead. But there was a lot of cleanup work to do. We had uh, non-core assets of well testing, uh, snubbing, um, uh, rental assets, and I went about making it more of a pure play, well-servicing company. And so that's what we did in 2010, um, April 2010, or sorry, maybe it was May 2010. Um, we went and bought more service rigs to give us critical mass. At that time, we were the sixth largest service rig company in Canada. Today, we are the second largest service rig company in Canada. And we were number one until one of my competitors ended up uh, buying assets last year and gotten themselves to a bigger size. Uh, in 2014, we went and uh, bought an eight drilling rig company um, uh, called Iron Hand Drilling. And so they were heavy tele double drilling rigs. Uh, we finished off building the ninth rig in 2014 and putting that into service. And it was one of the um, best utilized, it still is today, the best utilized drilling rig company out there from a public company perspective. Um, so, you know, we, the, these were the right type of assets uh, for our basin here in Canada um, and drilling to the depth levels that uh, the mo most prolific regions would, would be being the Cardium, the Motney, and uh, to, to uh, a certain extent, the Duvernay assets. So, you know, we, we did that in 2014. And as everybody recalls, OPEC stopped uh protecting price in late 2014. And therein uh, became the downturn in our industry in uh, beginning of 2015, and it lasted for quite a period of, of years. Uh, you may have heard the term long, um, lower for longer in terms of oil prices. And, and those terms were used in that 2015, 2016 timeframe. We thought we were coming out of this in 2017. Um, there was hope that we were, were uh, on the upswing again in 2017. And so the company uh, had a strategic alternative review process, ultimately ended up in, in buying more assets and, and doubling the size of our service rig business to, I think we had 149 service rigs at its peak. Um, and, and so we thought we were coming out of this. And so we are hitting record operating hours in 2018. Uh, with these new rigs that we purchased, uh, which was also purchased at a very uh, attractive purchase price. I think we spent $37.5 million on it, of which we also got four pieces of real estate in that transaction. That real estate was worth um, somewhere in the neighborhood of about $18 million, and we bought that for 10. Uh, so we did a very good deal uh, there. Um, 
So 2018 rolls around, we're off to the races in terms of, uh, um, you know, record utilization, uh, record number of operating hours on the service week side of our business. And then we hit the end of 2018 and something unimaginable happened in our industry, uh, which is uh, uh, we had a blowout of the WTI versus uh, uh, Western Canadian Select WCS which is the uh, the differential in price. It blew out to over $50, maybe even hit $60 difference. And we had a crisis from our customer's perspective in terms of what they were getting for their oil price. Alberta made the decision that all of the uh, E&P producers in Alberta needed to cut back on their production so that we can fix this um, Canadian oil price differential. And so that's kind of what happened. And so obviously, when you have too much oil in the system um, and you have production curtailment, activity levels drop. So 2019, beginning in 2019, we had to right size the ship uh, again for um, uh, for the company. And so we ended up, you know, obviously uh, uh, smaller in terms of number of active rate count. The... In the beginning, uh, towards the end of 2019, the production curtailment uh, situation was resolving. And so we ended up going into the winter months of 2020, January and February of 2020, with very good utilization, higher than it was in 19, and, and trying to get back to the 18 type levels. And then we got something else that hit us, <laughs> which everybody knows about being COVID-19, uh, which happened in March of 2020. And again, it dropped like a rock in terms of activity levels. Everything stopped overnight. Oil went negative for a day in April of 2020. And we end up hitting bottom in Q2 of 2020, uh, building again. Obviously, we did things in this company to make sure that we were a survivor. We cut costs very quickly in this company during that time. And, um, and, and then survive uh, for another day. So along comes 2021. Vaccines are, are now prevalent. Um, we basically uh, started going, okay, we can't waste a good crisis. We need to do something that is going to be better than what we did when we entered into this thing in 2020. So in uh, the summer of 2021, we identified some assets that we thought on the drilling side um, would, would really give us a leg up. And so we ended up buying 10 triple drilling rigs in Casper, Wyoming uh, at eight cents on the dollar. Um, and people just dismissed, well, that equipment must be junk because you bought it for so cheap and all that kind of stuff. But we proved to the rest of the world in 2022, last year, that when we closed this deal in November 2021 to get these 10 rigs, uh, that they weren't junk. Six of those 10 rigs ended up generating revenue, of which uh, helped us in our U.S. to, to expand uh, our U.S. division. Uh, and maybe I'll, I'll step back a little bit here. In 2018, when we had the production curtailment, our board made the strategic decision to diversify our asset base, just which was strictly in Canada, into the United States. And so we made the decision to go find U.S. customers and move two of our drilling rigs into the United States. The first rig went into the Eagleford, and the second rig went into, into the um, uh, Wyoming area uh, and North Dakota and, and Utah area. So we moved those two rigs in 2019. Our business model at that time was to crew those rigs uh, with Canadian crews, uh, but earning US revenue. So obviously we have an exchange rate advantage by paying our crews in Canadian dollars and collecting US dollars, obviously it's a 33% increase. And so that was good for our margins. 2020 hits, border shut down, we can't get crews across the border. Uh, and so our operations shut down for a period of time in 2020 until vaccines ended up becoming uh, discovered and prevalent. 
and we were able to get our people across the border again to start up operations in the U.S. Having said that, two rigs does not make a U.S. operation, and we were always looking for assets uh, at a good price, and that opportunity came to us uh, where we ended up buying the 10 triple drilling rigs in November 2021 at a very good, good price. To this day, sorry, it kind of got dark in here because of the my lights turned off. Um, uh, so to this day, um, we have proven that we bought those assets at a very attractive price and that that now we're sitting here in Q2 of 2023 and we have paid back all of the debt that we incurred to buy those rigs in, in, a, in a matter of a year and a half. So they've already, they've already paid back. Correct. And so as we uh, proved out our model, proved out that we can do this, uh, got U.S. crews, got a more significant presence in the United States. Last year, June of 2022, we announced another transaction where we bought three more rigs, three more triple rigs in North Dakota. And I'm happy to announce that um, the first of those three rigs have been upgraded and um, and and recertified. Um and to the to the point where we are now generating revenue off of that rig, and we expect the other two that we bought uh, to start generating revenue here, call it late June, early July, once they get um, recertified and upgraded as well. So, you know, we are off to the races. We have a built-in growth model here for the rest of the year. 2022 was a was a record year for CWC in terms of revenue, adjusted EBITDA, and net income. And we believe that 2023 is going to be another record year for, for CWC once these uh, two, well, the first of the three rigs are out January revenue now, and uh, the, the next two are also going to be January revenue later this year. So we think that that's going to be our growth drivers. It certainly has helped in terms of our profile in our company. We are now roughly 55% revenue and adjusted EBITDA. Uh, drilling contribution versus 45% for uh, what we call uh, production services or well servicing division being our service rates. And then from a U.S. contribution perspective, that's now over um, 38% in terms of our total uh, revenue contribution to our company. So um, we're a much more balanced, much more diversified company, uh, aren't reliant upon uh, one country's decisions with regards to pipelines and takeaway capacity. Um, now we have some options in terms of activity levels um, and and smoothed out our our um, black swan events, if you will, in terms of takeaway capacity. And, and, and Duncan, uh, you started off in the earlier part. You mentioned at one point when you first started, uh, it was uh, 30 times debt to EBITDA. And did you ever think that at one point you guys would be 0.9 times? Well, certainly, certainly that was the goal that we would be debt free at some point in time. I mean, we, we had a lot of bumpy events that happened in our industry uh, through the years through that time. Um, uh, you know, I, I did believe that we would end up being debt free at some point. 2023 looks to be that year in terms of a net. Uh, net, being in a net cash position. Uh, and when I say net cash, I define that as being our long-term debt minus our working capital, right? Uh, versus some some people's more conservative uh, definition being a long-term debt minus cash on the balance sheet. So, um, you know, we do believe that at, at some juncture here in 2023, we will be, and certainly by the end of the year, 2023, uh, we will be in a net cash position. And this would be the first time in how long? Uh, well, since my tenure. <laughs> so that's 13 years. Well, that's uh, the other thing I wanted to touch base on is uh, you talked about the strategic shift that was applied, which was there was a lot of other ancillary services, but the decision was made to uh, uh, prioritize the completion services. So right before we kind of get into that decision and why, could we talk about the different service lines that yeah. CWC offers, um, along with maybe some of the things used to offer in the past. You talked about snubbing and, and so forth. So if we could just start with those service lines and then we'll touch into the other parts. Sure. So today uh, we are two service lines, contract drilling or drilling rigs, 
and uh, well servicing or service rigs. Um, if you understand how a um, how the process of of getting oil out of the ground works, you need a drilling rig. Well, you do the seismic work, you find the formation, um, and 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 the ENP company decides how far uh, that commodity is underground. Then you basically go hire a drilling rig company like ours. And we would punch the hole in the ground, get to your, your zone in terms of where the oil or gas, the commodity is located. Uh, today, we don't just do vertical. We go vertical and horizontal to maximize the production for the EMP company because we have that, those type of technologies. So that piece of that first piece is what we would do, uh, what the drilling rig does. Once it drills that hole, the drilling rig gets taken off of the well and you uh, hire a completions or um, a fracking or pressure pumping company to do the completions work, meaning they go down, they basically frack the formation, so break up the rock so uh, with, uh, with propent and, and the, so that the oil or gas can flow out of, out of the formation. Once they are done fracking that formation, you, they go off of the lease site and you basically bring in a service rig to lay pipe down holes so that the product being oil and natural gas or liquids can come out of the hole through the pipe and actually enter into production. So we do the front end. We don't do the fracking piece. That's guys like Step that you've already interviewed here on your, your second podcast or sorry, third podcast. And then we would then do the uh, third piece, which is lay the pipe down hole with our service rates. And then for the duration of the life of that well, because a, a well doesn't flow from day one to the end of its life without getting, um, um, without requiring maintenance, pump changes, uh, workovers to remove the excess sand so that the oil or gas can can flow into the pipe more readily or freely. It needs it needs continuous maintenance or what we call maintenance or workover. That's what a service rig ends up doing. It takes it from the laying the pipe on completions work uh, the very first time. Um, and then we'll go back to that well. And on average for an oil well, it probably goes back seven or eight times to the same well until the life of the well is depleted and you would then need to go and pull the pipe out of the well and and uh, cap and cut uh, cut and cap the the well to to properly put it back in its place in terms of, of um, uh, reclamation reclamation work. So we uh, ha having service rigs, as much as there is a repeatable work on the same well, we would go and do all of that work with the service rig. And so that's what I call the repeatable piece of the uh, oil patch of production-oriented work to, until the life of the well is, um, is ready to be abandoned or, or decommissioned. So that's kind of the differences. Between, uh, that's the type of work that we would do is the front end as well as the duration of the work. The only piece we don't do, for the most part, is uh, is uh, the fracking and the pressure pumping piece. So this is a question that uh, was brought up by another, you know, uh, an investor that's kind of focused on natural gas. Um, and he's he, when he was looking at the OFS, his thought process was, hmm, why don't you just have integrated where you just oh, like you do everything, right? You do the pressure pumping, you do the fracking. And I just kind of noted that down. I'm like, okay, well, the next time I have somebody from, I'll, I'll ask them, like, why don't you guys integrate? And I'm pretty sure there's a reason and you'll share it with us. Uh, each one of those um, pieces of work requires different skill sets and different pieces of equipment. It's not to say that I couldn't go and get a, um, a fracking business, but it's a different piece of business, right? It's different equipment. It's, it's um, high pressure. You're injecting things down hole, you need to be a sand operator, you know, step would tell you that you're pretty much a logistics person when you're actually fracking. 
And, and so there's different pieces of the business all the way around in the oil, oil patch. And uh, traditionally, guys have focused on, on one piece and be good at that one piece. And that's kind of how the industry kind of got developed. Um, and one would, would argue that, you know, margins are better in one area or another, as the case may be, or competition is better in one area or another. And so, um, you know, it's just the different pieces of equipment and different knowledge level and the different type of stuff that needs to be brought uh, onto the onto the lease site. Um, everybody has their part. That makes sense. And then Nick, could you just talk about why your thought process when you were like, okay, we're going to remove the, some of the snubbing work that we do and some of the other line and just focus on just two, drilling and services. Yeah, the, the, the non-core assets that we had, we weren't big enough in size to go in and consolidate that up and wanted to be there and, and doing that type of stuff. So, you know, these assets were legacy assets that I inherited when I came over as president and CEO and I, I developed a business plan that says we, we shouldn't be in all of these lines of businesses because it's, you know, when you have different uh, lines of businesses, it competes for capital, right? And your capital source is limited by your debt levels, your operating cash flow, and equity raise. And so when you're limited in terms of the amount of cash flow to put back into the equipment and to grow, you got to make decisions. And so we made the decision that um, we were going to be focused on two areas well servicing, which was the original concept of CWC and what they wanted to build. And then when I came in, I basically expanded it to a drilling rigs and, and being on. And really it was um, when I, when we did made those decisions as a board and, and, and the strategies that I laid out for the board, um, it was really to um, make ourselves the most attractive that we possibly can for a potential exit in the future, okay? So when you look at our peer group, what assets that they have? Well, I had very, you know, we had um, peers that basically had both drilling and well servicing assets, but they didn't have fracking assets or pressure pumping assets. And so it didn't make any sense for me to go and expand into say a pressure pumping or fracking business um, but it certainly made a lot of sense for me to expand into a drilling rig business because now I look like all my other peers, right? So that's what we did in 2014. That's how we ended up getting our iron hand drilling uh, into our, our fold. Uh, back then when we bought it, it was eight, eight drilling rigs. Today we're 22 drilling rigs. So in that period of time, um, you know, I've grown the fleet to, to more than double the size. And uh, the other thing, when um, another thing to take into consideration is like the moat or the competitive advantage that you see that CWC has, right? They, sometimes the business can get really competitive, and um, it's important to know, okay, well, what does CWC have that 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 other competitors don't have that gives it that edge uh, relative to everyone else? Yeah, so when we first started out with the service rigs, um, we went and had a build strategy. As I told you, this company went and borrowed 60 some million dollars in, in debt to go build out a rig fleet, a service rig fleet. Well, those are still today one of the newest fleets in the marketplace. If you think about it, we started building in 2005, 2006 era. Uh, most of our, those rigs ended up getting built and finished in the 2008, 2009 era. Unfortunately, for the environment that they were in, uh, we had a little bit of a hiccup in terms of activity levels with the financial crisis. But it was still the bulk of, of newest rigs that are available in the basin on the service rig side. Similar to that, the iron hand drilling rigs also got its start in 2006 timeframe and um, and then you know ended up getting built out to a nine rig company by 2014. Again, those are the newest rigs in our basin. And so those are the most relevant rigs in terms of what the customers were looking for. Having said that, it always evolves. Year after year after year, the customer's requests uh, end up changing and we end up needing to change with the times. For example, 
uh, one of the requests these days is a third pump and fourth gen on drilling rigs. Could they get away with two and three? Yes, they can, but they're now getting spoiled and want more, right? For pumping capacity and power and pipe racks and all of those sorts of things. And, and so during that downturn, because we had a, a more favorable balance sheet than say a lot of our competitors, we were, and also we're running a very lean ship in terms of cost structure, we were able to reinvest in our equipment. Uh, uh, as as we went through during that downturn, to the point where uh, our equipment is 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 one of the most sought after pieces of equipment out there. The second advantage that we have is the quality of our crews. One of the taglines that we have at CWC is quality people delivering quality service, and I I I can't stress that enough in terms of why customers come back to us versus a competitor is because we provide a very good service to our customers. Uh, they're efficient. Um, you know, one of the things I'm proud about is our safety record this, this past year in 2022, uh, knock on wood. It's the lowest, uh, what we call TRIF, which stands for Total Recordable Incident Frequency. It's not just a measure of our safety record in terms of number of incidences that you have that are, so that's a recordable incident. And in our 19 year history last year, was the best year we had from a safety record perspective. And you think about last year, we were ramping up as an industry again, and lots of people coming into the industry, lots of potential for incidences or, or situations where people are gonna hurt themselves. And it was our best year from a safety perspective. And so good quality equipment, good quality people, is going to lead to good quality success in terms of utilization and and revenue and margins. The other thing I noticed is when we ended up when when the commodity price started to recede a bit, there was a maybe a heightened sense that okay, the OFS services are going to really start to feel it. Uh, it's going to materialize. But based on you know what I've been hearing from other companies or looking at uh, uh, their quarterlies, uh, the discussion I had with you prior, that doesn't seem to be the case. Could you discuss in ca in Canada uh, historic uh, uh, demand um, for the services seems to resonate? Could you discuss what Canada is seeing that's allowing us to see these high utilization rates despite maybe a lower commodity price uh, at this point in time? Yeah, absolutely. I, you know, let me just talk about the last, you know, the downturn in 2015 to let's call it 2021. When we had these black swan, what I call black swan events, like COVID, like production curtailment, like OPEC cutting, uh, not supporting oil prices. When we had these events, it turned on a dime in terms of activity level stopping. And I'm when I say turned on a dime, it's a matter of two weeks and all of a sudden it's like, holy shit, what just happened? Sorry about the language, but it, it's like, it's very um, reactive and very quick in terms of us finding out that, um, you know, what we thought we had for work was not gonna transpire. As oil prices started coming off the highs here last year from June, uh, given the Russia and Ukrainian war uh, hit 120 some dollar mark and started coming down to 80 by the end of this year. And this now we're at sub 70 uh, oil prices. I can tell you that activity levels have not slowed down uh, in a meaningful way, like for us collectively as an industry. And I don't believe that it is. And there's a reason for that here in Canada, built-in reason for that here in Canada. And that is because uh, in Canada, we have two major pipelines, one in oil, one in gas, that is uh, about to be commissioned and, and, and go online here by the end of 2024 and hopefully no, no further delays uh, that it goes into 2025. So those two lines are the TMX pipeline that goes to Burnaby that ships oil, crude oil, expands crude oil to Asian markets. And 
the coastal gas link pipeline where we are building a pipeline to feed into the LNG Canada facility um, near near Kitimat uh, uh, to basically ship uh, liquefied natural gas into Asian markets. And I think what is happening uh, in 2023 as oil and gas prices came down in the first quarter is that people aren't changing their budgets and their plans because, because of the need to fill those pipes. And even in the short term, um, even though they you know, may not get the same price that they need, they are looking longer term than that, that we will have a built-in solution here in Canada to take away our commodities. And so from an activity level perspective, I am not seeing, uh, as we speak right now, uh, any significant reduction in uh, the amount of work that we believe we're going to get here to the, you know, to the end of 23 and in, into 2024. And I think that those those two pipelines is, could be a major cause or reason why our customers are not slowing down their activity levels. Is the other thing is that there the other thing is that there our customers have been extremely disciplined here in terms of of their balance sheet and they are flush in cash over the last year. Uh, they're in very good positions. They do not need to protect the balance sheet because they have too much debt or what have you. In fact, they're make, they're they're generating very good free cash flow and they're making decisions to give that free cash flow back to their their shareholders, right? So with the very disciplined, very sustainable models that are going on right now in our industry from our customer's perspective, as well as our oil field services perspective in terms of not overbuilding equipment, like nobody's out there building new equipment today. There's that other discipline, whereas in past cycles, when you see an uptick in activity, everybody wants to go and get that and, and, and start building equipment. And then we end up you know, sometimes getting into a situation where where we have too much equipment in in our basin, and everybody has to compete on price then because they want they want to get their rig out the door or what have you. That's interesting, Duncan. I think I just was able to grab two key distinctions here. Number one, uh, with the rise in prices, you're not seeing guys on the OFS space trying to run around, grab equipment, and enter the market, start competing. So now that sort of secures in terms of price stability. Number two. Just because of how stable the balance sheets are for these companies, their drilling programs aren't going to be as volatile as they probably would have been, right? Because at that because they it, it is sustainable. They can set a program and they can hold even despite of the prices, which is new, something new, and could probably explain in conjunction with the other things that you've mentioned as to why things have been stable. And I I didn't uh, I haven't looked at it that way previously as well in terms of. A healthy balance sheet allows you to be stable in decision making rather than volatile. Right. I mean, if you had, you know, during the downturn years, a lot of these guys had a lot of debt on their balance sheet. Well, when you have that much debt, you really need to manage your, you know, because you're not going to get as much cash flow coming in the door because your commodity that you're selling, oil, gas, isn't fetching the same type of prices. Certainly in 2023, they're not fetching the same type of prices that they're fetching in 2022, unless you have a, a very large hedge position that you hedged out in 2022. And But the difference this time around is that those balance sheets are all corrected. All those, a lot of those guys you know, have debt levels that are extremely manageable, right? And, and they are being disciplined because they know what their shareholders want, which is a return on investment uh, uh, of either through share buybacks or dividends and or dividends. So that is the big change that has happened. I, in my career, I've never seen the balance sheets of our cust of our EMP customers in such healthy position before. And that is going to bode well for us on the oil field services side because we're not going to be as well tough. The second thing that I also want to point out that's going to be a, a help in terms of, you know, normally when you think of oil prices, uh, when they go down, the EMP guys don't have as much cash, and so they try and squeeze these their service providers. What I would suggest to you is that is not happening in a very big way right now. And then even if it did, we wouldn't be able to give back much anyway. Why? Because the inflation from a wage perspective, from servicing 
perspective in terms of our own suppliers um, being fuel, being our you know, in our world, uh, labor, fuel, and supply costs are our biggest um, uh, cost drivers. And all of those things have gone up in price. And so there's not much to give back to the EMP company, even if the EMP company wanted it to be. And, and the, the one constraint that has changed in the last decade, or maybe yeah, in the last decade, I'd say, is the people aspect. We are not getting, even as last year was running, uh, you know, everybody's hitting record type of numbers and, and whatnot. The constraint was a labor constraint. We're not getting the new entry level workers wanting to come into the industry for long periods of time and thinking about it as a career. They do come in, but they're not here. They, at least from our, our experience and, and our industry's experience and, and the subsectors that we're in, they, they're coming in and they're trying it. They realize the work is hard and they're not sticking around. So the amount of turnover I have from employees, the, the new, the entry-level positions, the, what we call floor hands and lease hands, those positions, the guys aren't staying more than three months. In fact, some of them are there only for a week. And, and it's tough. It's tough. And so one of the things we did as a company just here in our spring meetings is we gave a two-day leadership training course to all of our leadership in our company, 125 guys. We put them through leadership training so that we can deal with things that, you know, might um, uh, give them the tools that might help these younger guys want to stay on a little longer. So, for example, Was it just as, to allow them to resonate with the new generation. <laughs> so, well, there is. It's a generational gap issue, right? You it's it's probably no secret that the guys out in the oil patch talk um, <laughs> in a very masculine way. I'll, I'll just say that in a very masculine way, <laughs> and and this younger generation may not necessarily be. Um, no, I don't want to say they're soft. They're not soft. They just communicate differently, right? And they have different wants and different needs and all those sorts of things. But it's incumbent upon us as leaders out in the field, as well as our own office staff, to recognize the differences and try to bridge the gap from a communications perspective with those guys, right? You can't just yell and at them and all that kind of stuff. You got to go and communicate. So one of the things is open-ended questions. So that's the type of training that we went through for two days with some of my leadership 125 of my leadership group as to how do you go and ask an open-ended question to make sure that guy understood your instructions isn't going to go hurt himself and you know isn't going out there and potentially cause an, an issue from a safety perspective or or what have you right so we do things like that in our company um, to try and make ourselves better as leaders in our company, as the leadership in our company. And, uh, and, and we'll continue to do those sorts of things because we don't think the, the labor situation is going to get much better uh, over the years. And we've got to go and retain as many of those guys as possible. And so if, if it even converts one guy to a career, uh, to be a career oil patch guy, uh, that would be a success. So Duncan, uh, uh... Earlier, early 2022, when prices were really taken off, uh, even even at that point in time, the conversation was labor constraints. Um, I met you at the Schachter event. You know, we talked about the biggest thing you had mentioned: labor constraints. Now we've kind of we've we've pulled back a bit, so maybe the labor constraint maybe is not as intense before, since the the um, the amount of intensity. Uh, on year end has decreased a bit. But if we, you know, three, four, five years down the road, as we continue, it looks like we are going to be, you know, before it was lower for longer, it seems like we're entering into an era of higher for longer. So how do you see that play out in regards to the service inflation that will take place? If these are some of the issues that is still being felt, 
under this maybe lower commodity, you know, six, six, 70 to 80 type point, you can only imagine as we start to increase 80 above, that intensity is going to increase once again. And you still end up with the, the labor, labor constraints. So I'm just kind of thinking about this in terms of the amount of service inflation that could be anticipated um, it can be really immeasurably high unless something is done to address this labor situation. You're, you're bang on, so hey, uh, I see the discipline happening in our sector right now. Um, and when I say our sector, I'm talking the services sector in terms of not overbuilding on equipment everybody's needing a return on investment uh, for the equipment that they have, that we all know that there's likely a labor constraint and trying to convince people to come into our industry is going to be hard. Uh, in the past, we've used techniques like raising wages to attract people to come in. Last year, for example, CWC increased uh, twice on the well servicing side, three times on the drilling side. And uh, the total increase from the beginning year to the end of the year was 25 percent, their average their average hourly wage um, for a five or six man crew. And and so that's significant. Right. But you're right. Can you continue to do that? Increase that? Uh, the EMP side is going to be balking at it. But that's the short term tool we need if we have to get guys to come work in the oil patch. Having said that, it's not to me the way raising of wages that is going to keep people around. It's you have to start thinking differently in terms of working with our customers, to create the sustainability. The needs of these younger guys are different um, in terms of in the past, it, we go hard for six months in the winter because we know that's the busy season. And so you go and work as many hours as you possibly can. This younger generation doesn't want to go 21 days of working in a camp or what have you, and then take three days off. They don't want that. Uh, my senior guys on the rig, rig managers and drillers want that because they know when, when the sun is shining, you go make hay. But for this younger generation, the new guys starting out there, they give it a try and they go, what do you mean I got to work on Saturday and Sunday? <laughs> right? So, so... It's it's gonna take some time. It's I, I'm not I'm telling you right now, this issue is 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 here today. Our customer we need to work with our customers to solve this issue of a schedule, which is what they really want if they want to stay in the industry. Uh, and in certain places we can do that if we're working for one customer uh, exclusively uh, and that customer is willing and open. But let's face it. When a well goes down, and I'm talking about my service rig business right now, when a well goes down for our customer and they want to get that well up and going for to, so that they're generating cash flow from that well, they are not going to wait two days because, oops, my, my, my guys have time off this weekend. Like what's going to happen next in that situation is my customer that I've had that's been loyal is going to go, well, what do you mean your guys can't go work today? They're going to call the next competitor and, and they're going to take their rig. And when my guys come back on Monday, they've lost the job, right? So, you know, those are the sorts of things that um, that we, ha we have challenges with in terms of setting the schedule that, that the, the newer generation wants. Um, and we can't solve it alone on our side of the business. Um, Know, we we need to work with our customers to try and do that. But uh, I sympathize with our customers. I mean, if they if they if there's a well that goes down and they need that well to go back up, and it's a it's a Saturday or a Friday night, and they call, make the call, and you say you can't supply, <laughs> that's not a good answer, <laughs> right? So yeah. so that those are some of the sorts of challenges. I I, I mean. You know, in your in your uh, Twitter spaces, we've had these sorts of talks with some of your um, calm members. And uh, as I said before, it's not an easy solution uh, to find here because, um, you know, it, it, 
but we, we continue to try and break down the barriers as best yeah, we can. And, and that's and that's the part that just continues to intrigue me. It's just from the very start when we've been putting these spaces and, and starting these dialogues, it's always been a people issue. We know the services is more intense um, labor-wise than the EMP side, right? So it's a company of the same size can have triple, quadruple the amount of people uh, on the services side that you would have on the EMPs. So when the conversation goes to lack of people, lack of people, the people that are going to feel it the most is going to be on the on the service side of things. Um, and then as a as that continues to exacerbate and play out, I think my thinking at least is you could end up in a situation where the EMPs now have no choice. You know, you tell them, "Sorry, our new generation is." is Taking Saturday off, then they're like, "All right, <laughs> we'll see." I can tell you, our EMP that's... side won't won't care that much. <laughs> They'll look. Well, that's your problem. You solve it. <laughs> yeah. So I'm just uh... having said that. Having said that, you're right. Uh, we're very mindful of these issues. Uh, they're not easy issues to solve. Um, you know, if you have a customer that's willing to think more out of the box. Um, then you can maybe solve that on a one-off type basis in terms of a rig. Um, but, you know, it's not just to solve the, um, the, the entry level workers position, the new workers position. You got five guys on a crew on a service rig. Those, those rig managers and drillers, they know, like they, they don't want a five and two. A lot of those guys don't want a five and two type schedule. They want to go hard for 21 days, three days, you know, and take three days off and, you know, to reset their hours of service and then come back on again. Why? Because they know that this is a cyclical industry, right? Like there's something called spring breakup and that they got to go make hay when the sun is shining. And so those guys, you know, on a five-man crew, I have to have all five guys agree to those type of schedules, even if I can convince an E&P uh, company to work with me to say Monday to Friday only and to get their weekends off, right? So now at this point in time, Duncan, I wanted to just discuss, you know, valuations with you. So right now you're currently trading at two times uh, enterprise value to adjusted EBITDA. It was 6.3 times in 2021. In 2022, it was 3.3 times, and now we're currently at 2.5, 2.6. So what we're seeing is, you know, it's been a multiple compression uh, over the years. Um, so what, what are your thoughts in regards to um, uh, in, re in regards to that? Do you think, like, what are maybe some of the reasons you think that's taken place? Um, and just a little discourse in regards to that. So... These are the lowest multiples from an industry perspective that I have ever seen um, in my career. Um, normally, the historical range of a EV EBITDA multiple would be in the five to six time range historically. And trading now at a two to three time range for the biggest uh, oil field service companies in our sector tells me that investors either, one, don't believe that as oil prices and, and gas prices uh, move downward or move south, that your EBITDA is going to stay as high as the projections of analysts are, which then means you don't take the risk and you let the denominator fall so that it ends up getting back to a five or six times. But what I just told you earlier today, which is, from an activity level perspective, we have not seen our customers pull back their capital spend for the, well, for as we get out of spring breakup here, we're not seeing that pullback in a very significant way. And so we don't actually believe that there's gonna be a significant pullback. I mean, there might be a little bit here and there, right? But we don't actually see that happening. And so we believe that our activity level is gonna remain as we forecast for the most part uh, to the end of the year. And so the risk off approach from an investor perspective in terms of not believing the denominator being the EBITDA number is incorrect in, our, in, in their way of thinking. And as we play out 2023 and, and 
people see the amount of activity that is going on in the summertime and going into the winter season, into the Q3, Q4 seasons, or Q4 seasons, I think that that ends up getting adjusted. It needs to end up getting adjusted because the companies are just going to be generating that much cash flow for their for their uh, shareholders. And um, certainly for CWC, I mean, we, as I indicated to you earlier, we are, we have a path to to hitting record numbers again this year from revenue and EBITDA perspective, and and we certainly are on track to to do that. I mean, I have a slide deck in my investor presentation that basically gives a trailing 12 month uh, revenue and EBITDA number. And you can see those projection bar charts continue to better quarter over quarter, dropping off the fifth quarter. And so that just tells me that that hasn't changed. And um, and so, you know, at some point, the investors are going to have, will, will recognize that and will pay up for it. Or at least that is my hope that they do. And if they don't, well, the cash flow is going to come to, you know, our to to our shareholders in the form of share buybacks and dividends at, at some point. So, so Duncan, speaking of you know the free cash flow, um, we know uh, how much our EMP investors love their free cash flow yields. We recognize that CWC is currently at um, between twenty to twenty two percent free cash flow uh, yield. Um, can we can you talk a little about how do you guys what do you guys plan to do with you know this free cash flow? Um, and you did talk about buybacks and dividends. Could we just maybe yeah. just talk about that a little bit more? Yeah, sure. So uh, as I kind of indicated to you, we already talked about our debt level. Just give the uh, people listening to this podcast a view of how we look at debt. To us, using some level of leverage to manage your business is, is a good thing. So long as that leverage is, is at a very sustainable, comfortable level. For us, that very comfortable level would be using debt to um, manage your working capital. So roughly, I have about $35 million of working capital, $35 million of debt would be an ideal number. Why does that? It's because if I collect all my receivables and paid all my payables and we are to shut down the company tomorrow, that debt would be paid off. The rest of the asset base of the company, if I shut down tomorrow, I'm not saying I am, but if I did, would be distributed to shareholders, right? So your asset base, your equipment, uh, everything else uh, of, of value in the company would be distributed to shareholders. So that's your tangible, what we call tangible asset, asset backing or, or, or book value, net book value. So for us, we, we look at it going, we should use a level of leverage because our, our shareholders benefit from that. As I've already indicated, if we hit the numbers that we expect to hit here in 2023, we are gonna be in a net cash position. We're not gonna be in a net debt position, right? And so we have that net cash to pay to shareholders. But in, in fact, that's probably, we, we, we probably could pay more than that because our operating cash flow, uh, or what we call free cash flow, um, after paying interest costs and uh, capital equipment, um, capital expenditures, uh, would basically be all of the cash that belongs to the shareholder, right? And so, um, as you rightfully indicated, we think that our free cash flow yield at around 20, with the share price being around 20 cents, is roughly around 20 to 22 percent in terms of a yield. And so that money actually belongs to shareholders. And we think that rather than keeping in the company, we should be, you know, returning that to, to our investors, our shareholders uh, in the form of dividends or share buybacks. And uh, and that and and it's already something that we as a board have have discussed. If we go out and get it and we perform, that we will need to make those decisions most likely in around the September October timeframe. Sorry, you're on mute. So so yeah, so I was just going to say it's interesting because uh, this year looks like it's going to be the year 
for shareholder returns, uh, i.e. both the buybacks or dividends? Do we know if it's going to be more on the dividend side or the buyback side, or is that just like a just a premature conversation for now? Uh, it's a premature conversation. We have placeholder as to how much. And uh, if we go and execute the way we think we can execute, um, no decisions have been made at the board level. As you uh, can well appreciate, uh, dividend decisions and share buyback decisions are uh, the decision of the board of directors, of which I'm one of seven uh, directors in our company. Um, and, and so those decisions will be made at a later date. Um, but everybody is well aware that if we go out and get it, that We'll need, you know, we'll need to make some decisions. And I, I'll caveat all of that by saying, save and accept for anything else that might come about in terms of business combinations, M and A, and that sort of thing that we, as a board, might think is more attractive to uh, the shareholder base from an accretiveness perspective, right? So, meaning that twenty million dollars of free cash flow, if something came out of the woodworks tomorrow. And we all thought, oh, my God, this is going to transform the company to another level. Um, you know, we may end up choosing to do that and using that cash flow that we generate to to create even more value for shareholders. Well, this is good. This is uh, great. We covered a lot of material as we reached the top of the hour here. Uh, I just wanted to maybe just wrapping up. Uh, what, what are some of like what, what is the vision uh, moving forward that you see or maybe even highlighting to shareholders why is now a good time to start looking at OFS in your opinion um, for anybody that's maybe been on the fence or uh, doesn't have the OFS exposure because they've kind of focused on the EMPs you know what what's what would you share with them as to why maybe now would be the ideal time uh, to get some OFS exposure sure much like the EMP side in late 2021 was rectifying their situation and, and having higher oil prices and gas prices into 2022, you're getting in early. I mean, there's only a few oil field service companies paying dividends right now, but there's going to be more. And um, just because all of us are in the same boat with respect to having a, a good industry environment and activity levels, some are better than others with respect to their leverage level. And certainly CWC is one of those leaders in terms of our debt to EBITDA levels uh, at, at probably um, under levered capital, meaning we don't have as much debt. If you listen to stories of some of the oil field service companies, they are still going, I want to pay down my debt as fast as possible. Right. And that and if you've listened to CWC story for a period of time now, we've stopped talking about that here. We're now talking about dividends and share buybacks and not talking about paying down debt. And and so that, you know, we've done some great acquisitions here in the last two years uh, that uh, that we did with debt. And we paid most of we paid almost well we paid all of it off on the first acquisition two years ago and the the next one with these three three rigs uh, once we finished the capex spend on them for the upgrades and the recertification they're going to start generating revenue and cash flow so that'll get end up paying be paid off and call it a two year time frame right so we're no longer talking about our our paying down debt we are now talking about given returns to shareholders. And in CWC's case, I think if you, you know, while we don't have an, a dividend policy today um, or reinstated a dividend policy or a share buyback policy other than our NCIB, uh, which we are active on, by the way, um, uh, that would be a good time to take a look at, it, especially given the valuations that we're at. If you believe our, our that this team can go and execute for 2023 on the type of EBITDA that we think we can, um, you know, the decisions that are to be made here in the near future later this year is going to benefit you. And so that's why we think now is an excellent time to look at CWC stock. Awesome. Great. It was lovely having you, uh, Duncan. Uh, maybe closing statements and wrapping up vision for the future as it relates to CWC and closing statements yeah sure um you know of course i 
I can joke around and I say, you know, the Chinese uh, created the fortune cookie, so I have a very good insight as to what the future will hold for CWC. But uh, as, as people know, that I, I joke more about use that more as a joke. But uh, for me, I would like to see CWC get to a a meaningful platform. One of the knocks against us is we're pretty small still, right? We're a hundred and fifty, hundred and sixty million dollar enterprise value company. Um, still very small for institutional investors to want to take a significant piece and chunk in us if they if they're going to make an allocation in oil field services. My belief is that if you're going to be a sustainable public company, that, that we need to get to a billion dollar enterprise value, maybe even a billion dollar market cap. If you look at the biggest companies in our in our in our subsector divisions in the oil field service space, being contract drilling and well servicing, the largest of the large contract drillers is not even one billion dollar uh, market cap today. And um, I mean, they floated above and below, but today they're not above a billion. And I I have a vision that says, um, you know, I'd like to I'd like to see this company survive if it is a survivor, uh, get to a billion dollars so, so that it can be much more attractive from an institutional uh, investor base perspective. And, you know, for those investors that are early on that think that we can go do that, it's, it, it requires capital, no question. And whether that capital is available to to um, to CWC here today is is you know is a question to be answered, I guess, in a future date. Um, but we continue to do our best in terms of trying to find um, assets that make sense and and can build us a significant platform. With that, we'll leave it at that, uh, Duncan. We have now completed the fourth episode uh, of, of the podcast. And uh, uh, what we'll do is I'll end it here and uh, we'll catch you at a later date. Great. Thanks, Sohaib. This has been a wonderful, uh, hopefully your listeners uh, got something out of uh, out of the story, learned a little bit about the oil field services base and, and CWC story. Absolutely. Thank you. Great. Thanks.